we are going to talk about how you can design and sell your own products. We have a special guest for this interview, Andre. He is a computer scientist, book author, hardware design engineer and game developer. But what is most interesting, he has designed, manufactured and sold many hardware products. So he did this number of times before and uh, he knows what he is talking about. He also has over 58,000 students on his Udemy course. So if you want, you can check it out. So let's start. Here is my very first question to Andre. How do you know your project or your product is going to be cool and you will be able to sell it? So uh, that's the million or billion dollar question always, right? Uh, so, you know, what you want to do <clears throat> is when you're going to design any kind of product, the, there's two kind of things that are important, I think. The one is that it's something that you're passionate about, right? And uh, so uh, you can't let other people kind of decide what you should build or what you shouldn't build. You have to really want to build something. That said, uh, then you have to look at categories of things that you're interested in and then go out in the marketplace and just see what's available. Go on Amazon, go on eBay, uh, go to different stores, wherever, and look for your uh, kind of product that you're interested in making and see uh, if other people are developing it, selling it, uh, and, you know, kind of take a look and say, you know, this looks like this is a popular product and I can see where I could make one like it or improve upon it and, um, you know, maybe do something a little bit different, uh, you know, take a look at what everyone else is doing and kind of, you know, synthesize a better version of it. So that's kind of how you, that's basically how you tell initially what you kind of want to do. It's got to be something you're passionate about, and also should be something that you can maybe see out in the marketplace uh, exists and is uh, selling well or is popular. Or uh, there's always, if you really truly come up with something unique, uh, you know, the best product is always a product that solves some kind of uh, problem for people, uh, a pressure point or a pain point that people have uh, with whatever they're doing. If you can build a product that helps them do that, then that, of course, is always going to be a great product because people are always going to want to purchase something that reduces their pain or reduces their time to, you know, accomplish something. Mm -hmm. Why the factor, uh, like, you need to... You would like to design it by yourself. Why this factor is important? I have some answers in my mind because I know why I do it, but I think it's important to talk about this. Yeah, so uh, so <laughs> uh, working on projects is always fun in the beginning, right? Everything is super fun in the beginning. Coming up with the ideas and you know imagining building the product and so forth. But once you get down into the nitty gritty of it, uh, Building a product uh, with other people is, is complicated because uh, you have to interact with them, there's compromise, and then in reality, unless you're paying them, it's hard to motivate them to do anything. So, for example, you know, you have these different models, like if you have a company like Intel, obviously you're not uh, designing a new microprocessor without thousands of engineers. But if you're just, you know, a guy or a girl at your, at your house and you want to come up with a new product and build something, you know, saying, hey, to a friend uh, that wants to do something also, they've got to really be in the same mindset as you and be able to commit to a long haul, to a marathon, really. Um, building a product is a marathon. It's just very long. It's very arduous. And a lot of times what happens is people start off doing it and then they stop in the middle of it. So uh, a lot of times just better to try and do it yourself. Now, if you need <clears throat> certain kinds of, um, uh, say, skill sets that you don't have, for example, uh, maybe you're not good at doing a video or maybe you're not good at uh, doing some kind of art or 3D modeling, you can, you can uh, you know, solve those problems with contractors. You know, you need a contractor to maybe design a case or something like that or make a video, that you can do. But if at all possible, when you're doing small scale projects, it's always best to try and do it by yourself because then you control everything and you don't have to rely on anybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you countless examples where people get together and they're all excited. And then in the end, there's only one person left. And then, then there becomes problems with, you know, I contributed for 50% of the time. So I want some of the intellectual property because, you know, I bailed on your project, but all of a sudden your project made all this money and I want some of it, even though I bailed on you, you know? So anyway, I always think it's, 
if you can do it by yourself and maybe with one other person, you know, a Jobs and a Waz, you know, Paul Allen, a Bill Gates, that kind of thing, two, two people is great. If you can get another person that's like almost a clone of you to do the project with you, but uh, you have to be very careful um, uh, doing things with, uh, you know, groups of people where no one's getting paid. So, uh, yeah. And then, and then the other thing is a lot of times one person uh, finishes it, and this happens in Silicon Valley all the time. Uh, they split off and then one person finishes it years later. Uh, you know, this really explodes into something big. And then lawyers are trying to incorporate a new version of the company or get a venture capital. And they're like, you know, who's this person's name that was on these documents a long time ago? And they're worried about this person coming around and suing them or something. So anyway, yeah, you got to be very careful. And um, this happens obviously in electronics and projects, but a big area, you know, my background's also in game development. People want to make games and they get super excited about making a video game. And then within about two or three weeks, it's like the most impossible thing they've ever done. And everyone wants to quit. So, yeah, one person is best if possible. OK, so what do you think how long it should take to develop the product? So that's so that's another really, really good question. So it really depends on the category of product you're going to develop. So uh, what I tell uh, people that are starting up and trying to build uh, products is start off with something very, very simple. Uh, you don't want to build something complicated because engineers are really, really bad at judging time unless they've done a lot of products and shipped products. So if they've never done that and they've only been part of a product uh, development, one little piece of it, they really have no idea of all the different things that go into it. So they're always going to gauge time wrong. So given that, <clears throat> when you're starting off, the whole idea is if you could just ship an empty box, that would be a great product. If I could just figure out how to ship an empty box, which has a lot to it, right? Um, just even doing that is complicated. So you want to do a very simple product. Maybe, you know, down the line, you want to make maybe a $20 computer. That's great. But at first, maybe do something very, very simple where the timeline you're talking about, I want to finish maybe all the primary engineering and, you know, maybe a month or two, uh, do the software, the firmware, maybe another month or two packaging and, and so forth. So like six months is the absolute most because that's probably going to stretch out to a year. And then the problem is, is life always happens. See, people don't uh, add in life, right? Anything can happen. You can get sick. You can lose your job. This can happen. That can happen. And those things distract you. So the shorter you can go, the better. So ideally, <clears throat> if you can come up with a cool project or product idea and like in a long weekend, design it, and then start prototyping in the next week and the next week. Those are the best projects um, to start off with because it, you put in a little bit, a bit amount of time and you're gonna, you're gonna get a big return on investment. Because if you put in a ton of time uh, on, a, on a bigger project, you know, so many things happen. Like I said, life happens, but then also what happens is while you're developing the product, someone else all of a sudden develops it. Like I had one uh, entrepreneur I was consulting with and he was doing, uh, you know, these uh, earbuds, right? And this was before there were any earbuds, right? Now everybody's got an earbud, right? But it was right when they were, um, right at the point where earbuds were gonna come out. And I was like, this is a cool product, but you're gonna have to finish it really, really fast. Because I can tell you there's gonna be about 20 companies with earbuds on the market by next year. And of course, he got it working, but there was problems and then life happened. And then all of a sudden there was all this competition. So all that time he put in was just kind of a waste because there was too much competition. So anyway, if you can do something, I think the sweet spot for a first project is like, you know, three to six months and, and it's ready to be manufactured. That's great. But you don't want to do these one and two year projects because they really turn into three to five year. So three to six months, that's realistic, I think, to do all the elements if you stay focused to get a small project out. Six months, it means like finished product in box? Yeah, it's the, it's ready to go. You're ready for manufacturing. Um, and then and then, then comes all the manufacturing and selling and all that kind of stuff, marketing and so forth. But, you know, because you've you got to build the product, you got to test the product, you got to do the, you know, the, the um, uh, packaging, if it's got some kind of injection molding or 3D printed casing, you know, write software firm or demos, whatever. There's a lot of steps in there. And then, you know, and then find your manufacturer and all the planning and all that. So yeah, six months and you're like ready to flip a switch and manufacture these things. So that's kind of, that would be what I would uh, say is the longest time you want to really try and do it. And that in reality is going to turn into a year. And, and when you look at like uh, places like Kickstarter, 
um, what is it, 90%, I think, 90% of all hardware projects fail. And I look at their schedules and they're just crazy. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, we're going to get the money from you and then in three months we're going to have the prototype and then in six months it's going to be manufactured. I'm like, it's not. You you want to design this really complicated like 3D printer or something, right? Or uh, electric bike. That's just not going to happen. So a, a simple circuit board with some parts on it, maybe with a case, some packaging, some instructions, some demos, some firmware, maybe a website, whatever. That's a lot of work. And all that, you know, that's like something, if you could do it in three to six months, that's kind of what you're shooting for. So once you have your prototype working, uh, how much work you still need to do? Is it like prototype is like 20%, 50%, 80%? I think many people, they think like they are almost finished. Yeah, so, the, so you know, it depends what the prototype is a prototype of. But no, I mean, so you've got the prototype working, but there's a, there can be, a, you know, the prototype to the final product that you could actually ship to a person could be a huge amount of difference, right? So having a prototype is great. Now it's working, but now we have to make sure it's working so that it doesn't fail and so I can manufacture it and that I test it. And here's another area. You know, if you go to, you get a formal education, electrical engineering, embedded engineering, and so forth, you're going to learn about testing, quality assurance, you know, probability statistics, and, uh, you know, uh, cycling a product and all that. But a lot of people, when they build these products at home, they don't do any of that testing, right? You know, so, I mean, I cook things. I test things, let them run for weeks at a time, cook them, cycle their heat. I've got an oven, you know, all those kind of things. So you have to do that. So there's lots of other steps um, to get it. And then you have to cost optimize it also. A lot of times you might be using a couple of parts you think no big deal. And then you find out, wow, those parts in my BOM are going to cost this product to cost too much. So depending on what the product is, going from the prototype to the final product can be, you know, relatively short uh, or it can be relatively long. But, um, uh, you know, those two cases depend kind of on the product. So in the six time, six month time frame, uh, you should have your prototype like within two months. Yeah, you were, yeah. So that's you, and, and that's the whole thing. Uh, the engineering part typically is pretty relatively easy if it's something small. That's what we're shooting for, right? So you should have your prototype, you know, working within the first couple months. And, you know, if you just do the math, if you come up with a cool circuit board, uh, or cool kind of design. It might take you five or six iterations just to the circuit board, making things smaller, trying to get things to work, playing with it. And each one of those take maybe three to five days to get the PCB manufactured, right? So each one of those little cycles takes a week or two. And then now maybe you've got the hardware that you like. And so now maybe you got to write some firmware uh, or maybe some software. Maybe it's going to interface with something. So yeah, you're really shooting for making it small enough so I can get it done in like three months would be nice if you're doing a six month cycle, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. But everything, what you just mentioned, it looks like uh, a lot of work. So for your very first sale, shall you do everything this? Because you are still not sure if you are going to sell even one piece of your product. Right. Well, no matter what, you have to you have to build the product so that the product is manufacturable. It's not going to fail. It's tested and so forth. So that's why, you know, like, let's just say we say, um, let's make a product up real quick right now. Let's, uh, you know, I live in an area and uh, all, there's lots of teenagers here and they like to break in cars. Okay. And uh, so a lot of cars don't have alarms on them anymore. Right. That was something in the 80s and 90s. So let's just take a 555 timer. Let's take an LED a lithium ion battery, little watch battery, little switch, and let's make something that just blinks an LED. That so the design my, is pretty That was my first car alarm actually. Yeah, there, exactly what you me. described. I made one also and that's what I faked my alarm with and I I put it by the uh the uh, door handles uh, so it would look like, you know, it was blinking there. And I think it's so, sticker like this car is protected. Yeah, this alarm. car has got an alarm. Yep. <laughs> And so even that, so you, you sit there and you build it on some solderless breadboards. You're like, cool, you build a little PCB. And then it's like, okay, so, um, you know, I like the way this looks. I, I Maybe I did it with some through-hole components. So now I'm going to do it with some surface mount components. And then now I want to put it maybe a little 3D printed case. So I play around with some cases. Then I want to fix it to the car. I want to make the battery easy to, you know, uh, put in and put out. Maybe we're going to use a watch battery. 
and then uh, then maybe I say, how am I going to stick it to the car? I, I know we'll use uh, Velcro maybe, so it'll come with a little piece of Velcro, and maybe I'll put it in a little Ziploc bag or a little box, a little cool red box or something, and then I'll you know uh, put a sticker on that or, or something that slides over the box. You're probably going to manufacture 100 at first, do a little run of 100, right? And maybe they're going to cost anywhere from you know $1 each to $25 each, right? That's typically – so, and, and that's another good metric. When you're building your own little product, typically they're going to cost between – in reality, probably $5 each to $25 each is what most of the products are going to be. And then those products you might sell for $50 each to maybe $100 or maybe even $200 each. Um, and so, uh, but you still have to kind of go through those steps uh, at the scale for the particular product. Now, that was just an LED and a 555 timer. Uh, but now, if we're making something more complicated, maybe an Arduino clone, then we've got a lot of more work to do. We, you know, making the clones fairly simple, we copy the reference design. Maybe we have our own power system. Maybe we use some different things to it, but then we need to test it thoroughly, right? We need to test it with the IDE and this and that. Make sure we haven't forgotten anything or done anything wrong or, you know, so um, the testing phase might be longer. So anyway, uh, yeah, no matter what, you kind of want to go through all those steps uh, for the product, but that's why you have to pick something that's fairly simple, even though you don't even know it's going to work, right? But there's a big difference between manufacturing a million units not knowing it works and just the hundred, right? Mm -hmm. The hundred's going to cost you, you know, a thousand bucks to twenty five hundred bucks maybe, and and that's it. So you're going to spend a little bit of money manufacturing these, you know, no matter what. So um, if you if you say like it's going to be twenty five dollars, uh, then it's two thousand five hundred dollars for hundred yeah, pieces. Yeah, right, right. And 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 another thing also, obviously, at manufacturers now a lot of Chinese uh, contract manufacturers will do really really good pricing, right? And uh, what I typically do is when I'm doing my initial run of products. I'll say, quote me for 100, 300, and 500, mm -hmm. right? And then those tiers right there will get you, you know, decent prices. But then when you, you, you jump up to the 1,000, the 10,000, the 100,000, the prices are going to start, you know, dropping, you know, dramatically. And uh, that's that's when you can really see some savings. But uh, a lot of, you know, another thing people also do is as they're designing their product, um, you know, you always want to make sure that you're making some net money, right? You don't want to just break even. So you want to be careful and not say, you know, at some point I'll be making 10,000 or 100,000. That's really wishful thinking. You know, make sure that even at 100 or 300 or 500, you're breaking even or making money because chances are if it's a small hobby project or your first product, you're not going to be selling thousands of units. If you sell hundreds of units, you're probably doing pretty good. So mm -hmm. be careful not to say, once we start getting to thousands, you know, I'll start making a profit. You want to be making a profit right off the bat. So that's mm -hmm. where you want to set your, your price point. How much that's you another like discussion. to add? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, the rule of thumb really <clears throat> is this. Uh, uh, and so we're talking about distributors and whatnot. Most distributors are going to want a 30 or 40% uh, or resellers a 30 or 40% um, margin. So, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the retail price is, they're going to want, you know, 30 or 40% off of that price right there. So you kind of have to work backward from that to figure out what your price is that you're going to sell it to them. And then what the cost of manufacturing is so that you can make some profit. And that's if you go through resellers. Now, a lot of people don't go through resellers, right? They'll just uh, sell it themselves. They'll build a website and, and try and drive traffic to the website themselves. Uh, or of course, use things. There, you know, there are other resellers like uh, Amazon and so forth, which takes smaller margins. How much? But if you Amazon go try to, do you know? I think it's fifty. Well, there's different tiers where you can pay for different um, uh, uh, categories. You can pay for uh, different programs, but it's about fifteen to twenty percent, I believe. Last time I checked, uh, but it, but it does vary. Um, but like it's SparkFun or say Adafruit or Parallax or some of these more popular online. Uh, websites that distribute embedded products. A lot of those are going to want uh, thirty to forty percent. I didn't know uh, you margin. can you can sell through SparkFun or. Sure. Oh, yeah, look, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. If you contact SparkFun, they have a buyer at SparkFun. They have a buyer at Adafruit. They've got a buyer at uh, you know uh, uh, Parallax. You contact them, and then what would happen in a in a uh, project like that is you might make something really cool and say, hey, uh, you know, I like this. It's really cool. Are you guys interested in uh, reselling this? And they say, sure. Just you need to brand the PCB SparkFun or Adafruit mm -hmm. or uh, Parallax, and then you just go through and do that. And then uh, 
either the you know one or two things happen sometimes they'll just say we'll buy them from you you can manufacture them but a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people coming up with new projects they've never done manufacturing so that's another problem how do i even manufacture it right talk about that in Chinese uh, manufacturing, but SparkFun or Adafruit, they'll manufacture it for you, then they'll turn it around and just give you a royalty, mm -hmm. right? So I don't really like that because you're getting less. So I prefer just manufacture the product myself and sell it. And they say, hey, uh, Andre, we want 100 or 50 of these uh, this month. And then I just sell them for maybe $25 and maybe they cost me $10 to manufacture. And then maybe they sell them for $50, mm -hmm. $49.99 is the retail price. So, so in general, uh, this is the kind of rule of thumb that you're going to hear. Uh, whatever the cost of manufacturing is, ideally you would like the retail price to be three times that mm -hmm. minimum. That's kind of what you want. Mm -hmm. You want the to be three times that. That's kind of a, a good rule of thumb. Okay, because if you, yeah. some people they just add a little bit and and then later they find out they are just losing money. Yeah, they're just losing. And then there's so many other factors that go into it that people don't even consider. For example, you know, you get this product and you say, you know, I'm going to sell them. Let's just take a number. We're going to sell them to the customer, you know, for $10. Maybe they cost $5. And you're like, I'm going to make a $5 profit. And then you, and then you forgot, wait a minute, I need a box, mm -hmm. which is 50 cents. I need some packaging. I need some shrink wrap. I need the labor to do that, mm -hmm. right? I need to put in maybe an instruction manual, maybe a cable. You got all that. Then you have to consider shipping. And then everybody's like, you know, shipping is free. Well, shipping is not free, right? In the United States, typically we're going to use um, priority mail or first class mail. So you have to compute how much is that going to cost? You know, so, you know, I remember uh, another entrepreneur had a, a product and uh, they put it on Kickstarter and this and that, and they literally completely forgot about shipping. But then what was even worse was they realized that we got to, put these things in boxes, but they didn't realize that they had this small little board, but then the box to put it in was so much bigger. They had like 800 boxes or something, a whole room of boxes. The, their entire little suite was filled of boxes that they had to buy. So just like little simple things like that, you've got to, you know, uh, consider when you're, when you're going to do this and all these prices, you, you have to put them in. You can't just like dismiss it and say, no big deal. We'll worry about it later. You don't want to do that, but they're also an opportunity to make more money. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of psychology with pricing, right? And uh, people like, for example, you can sell a product and the product is like, you know, 19.99 and uh, maybe someone won't buy it for 19.99, but they'll pay 14.99. But then shipping is like $10 mm -hmm. and they won't even care. They'll say, well, shipping is shipping. I get mm -hmm. it. You have to pay, but the shipping wasn't $10. It was only $1. So maybe you can make up some of the money in the shipping because people are less, uh, they, they're less resistive about shipping price because they realize shipping costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So you got to play with these things in your, in your prices, but you got to always do it to make, make sure you're making positive, uh, revenue mm -hmm. on your product. Yeah. I agree. So we, we still don't know if we are going to sell. So we, we created this alarm, we tested it, we have it in the box, uh, but we still hope we are going to sell it. So, so what will be the next steps? You have your product on your table in the box, what you are going to do? Right. So, uh, so prior to getting the product completely done, you'll, uh, of course you do all these things in parallel, right? So, uh, we go out and we identify. So now we're kind of talking about uh, marketing and, and getting ready to kind of seed the market with our, our product idea and get people ready to accept and purchase the product, get, get them excited about the product. Right. And again, we can do this at all different kinds of scales. So what we want to be doing uh, beforehand is we, we want to be, you know, generating interest in a product. We want to let people know that a product, uh, we're developing a product as we're doing it. Maybe we have some pictures, some specs, some whatever of the product. So you're going to, you know, kind of make a list. And this is a, this is a, this is a, a complicated, long process also kind of, you know, planning to sell a product and then selling the product and then uh, continuing uh, after the product is selling to maintain <clears throat> this uh, kind of product sales uh, channel uh, that's going on. So, you know, you go out and you say, uh, and depending on what it is, let's just say we're going to sell some, uh, maybe a little electronic gadget. So then, you know, we could go and say, well, let's try and sell through distributors, right? So we could contact the spark funds and the, the Adafruits and the parallaxes and all these different kind of uh, companies that sell these kind of things. And we could go contact them and say, Hey, we've got this, send them a prototype. And they're like, great. We love it. We're going to sell that. Now your problem is solved, right? So that's one avenue, right? Uh, that that you can do. Now uh, 
the other thing is if you plan on kind of doing this more yourself, then you're going to want to start contacting uh, different uh, media outlets in one way or another. So, uh, for example, we've got, uh, you know, classic magazines, right? We've got our, our nuts and bolts. We've got our servos. We've got our circuit sellers, you know, th that kind of have electronic gadgets. We've got our Scientific America, whatever. Whatever the product is, we can uh, run ads in these magazines, right? But now we... We only want to run ads once our product is ready to sell because the ads are very expensive, right? They're five hundred to five thousand dollars to get uh, a quarter page to a, a cover page kind of thing in most of those kind of magazines. But magazine uh, uh, putting ads in magazines is another way that we're going to do it. However, we want to do things as much as possible for free. So another thing we can do again now this is more like right when the um, right when the product is, is ready and, and you're ready to sell because you don't want to, you want people to be able to buy it once they see this ad. Another thing that you're gonna do is make a list of every kind of magazine possible that talks about your kind of products. And most of these magazines have an editorial section or a new products uh, section. And uh, the new product section basically says, you know, here's the new products coming out, a little bit of copy or text describing the product, maybe a picture. And it says, hey, Google is coming out with new Google Glass and this company's coming out with this little gadget and, and so forth. You can contact the uh, editors there and say, uh, you know, I have this new product, it's coming out or it's out. And then you can uh, give them some copy, describe it, a picture, what whatnot, and then they'll go ahead and, and if, if you're lucky, they'll put that inside of their uh, magazine in the new product section. So, so magazines. The other thing, of course, is all the different media platforms. So you've got your like your Reddit's, uh, and then you've got websites that might have something to do with what your product is. So, for example, if you're doing, say, an Arduino <clears throat> kind of product then you're going to want to go on the Arduino site in the forums maybe and just post on there and say, hi, you know, I've got a new product that's coming out and it's going to be coming out, you know, this time or it's already out and, uh, and, uh, and, and post on there or post on a Reddit that's about that specific topic. So you're going to want to make a list of all the websites, of all the magazines, of all the YouTube influencers. And then to get people to do things, you're just going to, you know, be as charming as possible. But then also you may send uh, samples or prototypes uh, to people that are have the same interests as you. So, for example, there's a lot of uh, retro channels on YouTube that do retro computing, 8-bit computing and so forth. And they're really into that kind of stuff, right? So maybe if your product has something to do with, maybe it's um, uh, a retro product for uh, an Apple or an Atari or a Commodore retro computer, 8-bit computer, maybe it does something, maybe it's an SD drive or, you know, something like that. You send them a prototype or a sample, they're going to be, uh, there's going to be a higher likelihood that they're going to talk about your product and say, hey, today on the new product bag, I want to talk about this new product that's coming out or is out. You can purchase it here and it does this. So that's the kind of things that you want to do. So you want to hit as many uh, media outlets, YouTubers, uh, magazine articles, uh, magazine editorial, new product editorial, and uh, those kind of things. Now, the other thing that you want to do <clears throat> to get this out here is you want to do press releases. And uh, most people never do press releases. They don't know how to do them, but it's pretty easy. You just go online and type in online press release. And there's a number of companies that do these, like PR Web and so forth. They're... 100 to 500 dollars usually to do a press release that'll go worldwide in a number of categories and what we're looking for is to put it so that all the technical editors every monday or tuesday they go and look at all the press release streams and they say oh here's a interesting looking product i'll put this inside of my blog or i'll put it inside of you know here and so you want to do a press release now what i typically do is do like three press releases before a product is launching, I'll say, talk about the product to kind of get people anticipating it. When the product launches, I'll do another press release. And then once the product is, sales are starting to flatten out, I'll do another press release just to remind everybody. This is and interesting. So, this was actually my question, like, does someone read this press? Because I don't read them, but th this is a very good point. There are maybe some editors uh, and they yeah. find this kind of uh, information useful because they don't have to browse through all internet. They don't have to. That's right. That's right. And so you're giving them content. You're saving them time. That's what their job is. And depending on what their category is in tech, they'll um, you're saving them time and you're giving them good content. Uh, so like anything, uh, there's a, just an enormous amount of, of data and garbage and noise coming out in these press releases. So you have to kind of know how to write a press release. It's got to have a good title. It's got to have you know, pictures and images. And now in, in the year 2022 here, you can, uh, you know, uh, on 
these press release platforms, you can put pictures and videos, and then depending on who picks up the press release, which editor, which magazine, which online channel, they'll link to those videos or those pictures, and they like that content because it's like, cool, I didn't have to do all this work, you know, so, uh, you know, that's that kind of thing. This itself the, is like a lot of work. It's not even yeah. like developing the product, but... <laughs> Right. No, it is. And you got to make these big lists and they are tiring uh, to do. And then the other, the other thing also, again, we're trying to get free uh, advertising here, free, free, um, you know, uh, information uh, to get it out to people is you go and you locate <clears throat> some of the most popular uh, newspapers. Now, most people think that no one reads newspapers, but they still do. The New York Times, the San Jose Mercury, you know, the, the LA Times, whatever it's called. These, these newspapers exist and they still sell <clears throat> millions of units. So they have uh, tech columns, which are by a lot of very famous uh, tech you know, writers. And these columns, uh, a lot of times will have new products also, cool things that are coming out and they'll have sections about cool things. So don't be afraid to go and contact uh, newspapers in these categories, uh, you know, and say, uh, find who, who does the tech column and then who does the new product column and then, you know, write them uh, or her and, and say, hey, I've got this new product coming out and here's what it does and here's a picture of it. And a lot of times they'll be like, that's really cool. As a matter of fact, I'm doing a whole series on, you know, sub $20 computers or I'm doing a new series on electronic scooters or whatever. And this would go perfectly. Uh, we could talk about your new product. And so. Again, this is another thing to do. You are actually um, answering so my questions as, as they appear in my head. Like, I know uh, some of these editors, they are super busy because they receive like many, many uh, emails and requests like, uh, please promote my product, please promote my product. So, right. you know, uh, you need to be somehow different to actually get right. their at attention. How do you do that? Yeah, you absolutely do. And, um, you know, and, and being different, you know, there's a reason why there, you know, some people are entrepreneurs and some people aren't. People who are entrepreneurs want to be different, right? And, uh, you know, just a quick little anecdotal story. When I was trying to get contracting jobs when I was younger, a lot younger, right, in my teens and early 20s, you know, I wouldn't just send a resume. I remember one time uh, I was trying to get a game job and what I did was I, I made a videotape of all my demos and I attached it to my resume and they watched the demos on the videotape. That was, you know, back a long time ago in the 80s. And, you know, and I got the contracting job. Another time I uh, sent the, um, the resume and I knew when they were gonna have the meeting and be going over the resumes. And I had pizza sent to the company, to the room where I knew there were, you know, looking at resumes and I said, Hey, take a look at my resume and you know, here's a pizza on me. And I got that job also. So the whole idea is you're in, you're in a sea of noise when you're talking to anybody, right? Everybody's got the same thing. They want the same thing. You got to be different somehow, just anything to be different. And that's, that's key. Uh, you know, and being different and just being, you know, honest about it, you know, just, um, just being honest about it, not, you know, lying or exaggerating about the product, just telling what the product is and all that, and just somehow being different to get their attention. That's real important, you know. Okay. Um, how do you set up your website and, and store or shop? Because we, we would like to make all this noise, but uh, we still don't have a way to sell it. Right. So, you know, there's lots of ways to do that. So uh, if you have a little bit of a budget, you might be able to hire somebody and somebody can set you up a website. Uh, these days, they're pretty, you know, cheap to have somebody, uh, you know, on Fiverr, something like that, set you up an e-com site where they take a template from, say, Template Monster that you go and look at and you say, hey, I like this template, this is really cool. I just want you to put my product on these pages and then I want you to connect it to PayPal. So you can pay someone to do that, uh, you know, maybe 500 or $1,000, or you can just make a WordPress site or you can, you know, uh, sites like uh, PayPal have templates. So you can basically make an e-com site just using PayPal itself. So there's different ways to get a website if you're not obviously web savvy and, and want to even mess with that. So you can pay someone to do it. These days it's not that much, or you can uh, go onto something like PayPal and you can make a storefront right on PayPal that connects right to your account. And just with a lot of clicks and just adding your content, make that happen, you know, so, that's um that's basically how I recommend people to do that and and 
I do recommend keeping, you know, keeping this part simple, but also looking at what other people do. You don't want to make your website look like it's something from the 90s. So that's why I say, you know, use one of these modern looking templates that you can get from like Template Monster for 50 or $75. If you're going to do your own website and host it kind of thing or have someone do this for you. Um, but if you do a, uh, use, say, PayPal has, you know, the ability to put up a website for you. And there's lots of these online systems that allow you to make an e-com website. You can just type in uh, e-commerce website or simple e-commerce website. And there's a number of these companies where you pay a fee of like $19 a month or $29 a month. And you can pick from a number of templates. And then just with literally a few clicks, you can put up your website and put up your products and you're done. So that's kind of what I suggest rather than doing something crazy and then writing a website from, you know, scratch and, you know, PHP and JavaScript and all that. You don't want to mess with any of that. You want this up in like a weekend or a week, get the website up and just to sell the product. And, you know, just keep it simple with the media. And here's another thing, a big mistake that I see that people make when you're going to build a website uh, and have a product, make sure you have the copy about the product, the technical specs about the product. Make sure you have images, lots of pictures of it. And if there's, if the product does something, have a video of it so I can see what it does. A lot of times people have a really small picture and then they have a bunch of copy and they're thinking like engineers. That's not what it looks like when you go to Amazon or Sony or Xbox and you look at their products. You're like, wow, I, I, I am dying to buy this. Or you go to Tesla you know, look at what other people do. Things have got to be attractive. They've got to draw you in. Uh, and that's, you got to use a lot of media to do that. So you got to take a lot of pictures and make things pretty and make things interesting so that people want to click on it. But anyway, a website shouldn't be, it used to be a big problem. Remember doing e-com back in the 90s used to be very difficult, right? And um, very, very difficult setting up merchant accounts and all that. Now it's super simple. Okay. So uh, yeah, keep it simple on the website. Next question. I'm most people can do the uh, pictures. I know professional pictures m may look a little bit differently, but even like me or normal people can do pictures. But what about copywriting? Because text is like super important. Yeah, text is super important. So, uh, you know, in my case, I mean, I write for a living, so I don't find it difficult to write, but you can, again, if you have to, what you can do is you can go out onto a website like Fiverr or Upwork, and uh, basically you can describe your product. As an engineer, you can describe your product and you can um, show pictures of it and whatnot. And then you can hire a copywriter. Are they and good? How do you on, recognize which one is good? You have to do a test. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Right now, one of my friends uh, is writing a book uh, about his uh, his uh, his. Uh, history in Silicon Valley and starting up a company and his relationship with Steve Jobs and all that. It's really cool. And um, so he's written all the outline of the book and, and he's going to get someone, a ghostwriter to write the book. So <clears throat> he wants to see given, you know, a page of information, some pictures, he went on, you know, Fiverr, one of these websites and said, write me a sample page that you would write in this book of copy so I can see your writing style and how it looks and how it feels and is it like what I want. And that's, and that's all you do. So you go and you do a test and you might have to pay a little bit and these things aren't much, right? So for example, if you go onto these websites uh, that uh, have people that do copywriting or coding or whatever, you can get, you know, a sample written for like, you know, 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. So 10, 10, 15 bucks and just do five of them. And of course, you're going to look at the reviews, right? If they've got like three reviews, no. But if they've got like 3,000, they didn't make up all 3,000. And then, and then also there's feedback from customers, right? So these, they're like Wikipedia. There's a feedback loop, just like on Amazon or, or Yelp. So you can see the reviews of the, uh, the customers, right? And so you just pick a few of them and then let them write writing samples and say, great, what you write, I, I like the way that you write, and then that's it. And then you hire them and just say, I need copy on the page, I need copy on the product page, I need copy on the about, whatever. And that's not going to cost a lot. And again, if you can't do it, you must know somebody that's better at writing than you, right? So you just say mom, dad, girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, sister, brother, uncle, whoever, hey, can you write this couple, few paragraphs for me, you know, something like that, and, you know, take, buy you a beer or something or whatever it is you want to do. And you can do that. So you can always get someone to do it. And then um, the other thing is you can just write it yourself and just have some other people just review it, right? And just 
catch some of it if if you don't have any budget. So again, there's again the whole thing is is you can always kind of throttle up how much money you want to spend on everything. If you have to do everything yourself, then you have to do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. But you can always ask for help from other people. Most people, like if you have a friend, you know, some of your friends are going to be very articulate, right? Some of our friends are very witty and articulate, and you know they just uh, just a uh, you know, like uh, David Duchovny from uh, X Files, right? He's got like a English degree from Yale, I think, or Harvard, and he's super witty, super articulate. If he was my friend and I wrote something, I'd like send it to him and say, "Hey, could you read this and edit it for me?" So you can always find somebody who um, uh, who can help you with you know copy if you can't pay for it. Okay, another question. You mentioned like uh, asking all the kind of different people for feedback, for example. I find it super hard because uh, everyone can give you different answers and then you don't know what is the right thing to do. Right. You're saying with, say, the copywriting? Uh, yeah, but it can be general. It, it can be any kind of feedback, even about not only about website, but also about your product, for example. Right. So um, if you're going to, whenever you're asking anybody anything, right, You know, like Steve Jobs said something one time, like, you know, customers don't know what they want and they, they don't you, a lot of times you have to show them what they want, then they realize that they want it. So you're right. When you ask, if you take 10 friends and you say, like you make three different logos or five different logos and you show 10 different friends, they will all give you different answers, right? So a lot of times <clears throat> what you're looking for, if you want any opinion from anyone, right? Maybe just to see, are you just like really on the fringe in one direction or the other and and maybe they'll say something that'll make you think you know what that's that's probably a bad idea to put blue and red together in that logo or whatever right but most of the time you're going to have to go with your instinct and your gut and just do what you want to mm -hmm. do you can get feedback from other people but there's a difference with getting feedback from experts right so if i get feedback from an expert or two or three experts in something and they say you really have to do it this way the way you're doing it is is not going to work and here's why mm -hmm. right that's that's a good argument for you to change what your attitude is but mm -hmm. when you're talking about something that's purely subjective right then no one's right no one's wrong right You know, if you were to tell people they'd all be staring at little three-inch screens in the year 2022, they'd laugh at you, you know, 20 years. They'd say, why would I do that? But now they do. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's good to get opinions from people. That, and I know some people that do this too much where they ask everybody other questions. What should I do? What should I do? What should I make it look like? You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. And uh, it, it's like this. I always make a, an analogy. You know, a lot of people go out and they say, you know, do you like this character? Do you like this piece of hardware? Do you like this or whatever? And then I say, when you go to a restaurant, do you go around to everyone and say, hey, what do you like to eat? What do you like to eat? No, you eat what you want to eat, right? So it's okay sometimes to say, how's the steak or how's the burger or how's this? But you shouldn't ask other people's opinions and then do what they you know, tell you to do, mm -hmm. unless they're specifically an expert in a mm -hmm. field that you know nothing about. So you got to be very careful with that. But it doesn't hurt just to get some feedback, just to make sure you're not doing something cuckoo you know, and crazy. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, so, so ideally, if you are asking for advice, then ask someone who is more clever in yeah, that area. And, and, yeah, someone who's an expert in it and has, you know, shown expertise in it. That's what they do, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, you know, again, if uh, if um, you're going to do something mechanical, right, you're not a mechanical engineer, right, you know, and you... and you, you want to do something, you know, talk to your friend who's a mechanical engineer and get some ideas from him and he'll he'll be like, you shouldn't do this at mm -hmm. no, this is completely wrong what you're doing, trying to do this isn't going to work and here's why. Oh, that mm -hmm. makes sense. But if you're just asking random people, do you like re the red one or the blue one? Mm -hmm. That's useless. But if you're asking someone who's got an expertise in GUI design and UI design and they're like, yeah, you never want to do two or three fonts, you don't want to do this, there's reasons mm -hmm. that they've read in books and studied and the psychology of it. So that's why they're telling you that. Okay. So you got to be careful. Mm -hmm. I would like to go back to the uh, contracting for work. So uh, you mentioned Fever a couple of times. I've used Fever a couple of times, uh -huh. usually for uh, like medium jobs, like not really important. Once happened right. to me, I asked them to design a t-shirt and mm -hmm. they did the design. Uh, mm -hmm. But like two weeks later, I could buy my t-shirt somewhere in Philippines with my, uh, you know, logos. Or... Right. So what about like, you know, this protection of your ideas and designs and everything? So you want to so talk about a little bit about uh, protecting things. Yeah. yeah. So. 
Um, so, you know, uh, there's a lot of different, a lot of different uh, levels of doing this, right? So whenever you create anything, if you write a book, if you make a video game, you make a piece of hardware, this is automatically copyrighted, right? And um, if someone does uh, steal this or copy it uh, without your permission, you can sue them. Suing them costs a lot of money. Getting a hold of them costs a lot of money if they live in a different country and so forth. And then and they could cause damages to you uh, if they uh, don't have any resources. There's no way for you to get back these damages they can cause to you. So the whole idea is a lot of times people are really paranoid about their ideas because they're worried that someone's going to copy something or do something. So you have to say to yourself, you know, uh, what's what's the modicum, uh, minimal amount of work I want to do to protect whatever it is I'm going to do. And I want to be realistic and honest about it because here's the thing. Like, for example, I've manufactured, I don't know, 70 products in China and uh, never once to my knowledge has one of these products been cloned and copied and mm -hmm. sold. And I wouldn't even care if it was. And here's why. Because designing the product and stuff, that's not the hard part. The hard part is manufacturing it and selling it mm -hmm. and supporting it. So if you want to copy my product and manufacture it and put the money in and go sell it and deal with stock coming back and customer support, go right ahead. Right? So um, so anyway, you know, sometimes people worry about things uh, like that. Now, uh, and, and another thing they do is is they'll say, okay, I'm going to come up with this cool product. I'm going to try and patent it. Right? Um Patenting doesn't is not really going to help you. First, it's thousands of dollars to get a patent, and it's a long time to get a patent, right? Now, um, even if you do get a patent, the only companies that are probably ever going to copy your product that would have the resources to copy it and manufacture it and do something useful with it would be legit companies that are probably not going to want to violate copying someone's product with or even without a patent. Mm -hmm. So you don't really need, you know, the patent now. Of course, sometimes patents are important if you're in the business of intellectual property, right? Like, you know, if you work at Microsoft or Google or places like this or Intel, they're constantly coming up with new and novel ways of doing things and ideas, and they want to patent those things and protect them from their competitors, which are doing the exact same thing. So I would say uh, someone who's building a product, uh, by definition, it's copyrighted. People cannot copyright, uh, cannot copy your product. At minimum, if you come up with a cool name for something, you can trademark the name mm -hmm. at the trademark and patent office, say, in the United States and other countries have similar yeah. uh, I think facilities. we talk once about trademarks and they're like much cheaper, uh, like yeah, 500, trademarks are, Yeah, they're, they're very cheap. You, can, you trademark a name like Windows or Pentium or, you know, whatever it is, or Xbox. You can do that if you don't want people to copy that. But just by law in general, uh, if you create a, a work of art, you know, a composition, a piece of engineering, this or that, someone cannot just copy that. You can sue them. But again, that's your only recourse, right? It's to sue them. So if someone is not afraid of being sued, then they're going to, they, then mm -hmm. they can copy it. And even if, even if they copy it, they could say, Hey, they're going to sue me. We have more money. We'll just mm -hmm. go back and forth for years and lock it all mm -hmm. up. So I think, uh, you know, there's a, a big thing where people are always worried about someone stealing my idea. I wouldn't worry too much about that. No one's really thought of anything new. And especially when you're building little gadgets and whatnot, only if something is extremely novel, extremely unique, no one's really thought of it. You honestly came up with something like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can't believe it. Then if you want, uh, you could do say a provisional patent, right? You could file a provisional patent, which basically protects it uh, from anyone else stealing it now and and how would anyone even know about it until the product's out in the first mm -hmm. place right but you can file a provisional patent which uh protects it for a certain amount of time and then you can go file uh the the complete patent later once you have money anticipating you're going to get a lot of money now that's under the circumstance that you're doing things yourself right so it's already copyrighted you can do a trademark if you want maybe if you really really want to, you can do some kind of provisional patent uh and then uh, to protect it for a short amount of time but if you're getting money from investors this is a different thing mm -hmm. because now investors are going to say and now this is a whole different thing say you want to make a product and say i need 50 or 100 thousand so i'm going to try and raise a little bit of money or 200 thousand whatever it is from some investors maybe some angels maybe a real small boutique venture capitalist that you know is going to do a 50 100k investment they are going to say is your ip protected and mm -hmm. they are going to want you to patent things and things like that because you know that if that's all you have, they want to make sure that's protected. And that can waste a lot of money. So you can waste a lot of money protecting something you haven't even finished, manufactured, sold a single unit of, 
and it's going to make nothing. So that's why I always say, you know, um, you know, I, I never patent anything. The only time anything's ever been patented, I, I, uh, a lot of products I've developed uh, were patented. My names aren't even on them, which is also uh, illegal. So like a lot of companies that I worked for, right, I would write algorithms or do this or do that. And then they would put the CEO would put his name on the patent or mm -hmm. the manager would put his name and they wouldn't even put the engineer's name. Um, and so those things never became disputed or whatever, but they just wanted to patent everything because they mm -hmm. had the resources to do it. But for us, I say it's already copyrighted put copyrighted right on any kind of product packaging, this and that, maybe trademark it. And if you really want to go far, um, do a provisional patent. But if you have something that's like going to change the world, then go talk to a patent attorney mm -hmm. and they'll kind of tell you, you know, uh, or an IP attorney and they'll kind of tell you, here are the steps you should take to protect this. But again, it doesn't really matter unless you design it, manufacture it, sell it and make money. And it becomes super popular so much that someone's willing to copy it and, potentially be sued and litigated against mm -hmm. right i agree i i always think like you know if someone in china or uh, somewhere in asia or i don't know in these countries will copy something how you are going what you are going to do you know yeah if, but you just don't do anything you just don't do anything because they still have to manufacture it so the question they is, still have to it, sell it or or somehow it. It, but, and that's right. what is the hardest part yeah yeah, and that's the hardest part. And here's the here's the reality of it. Let's just say, for example, that I'm selling my product on sites in the United States, Amazon, this, that, whatever. And then I find on Alibaba, someone is selling my product, right? So what? It would be almost similar to uh, me selling them to them and then them reselling. The only difference is they just manufactured them. So they still had to pay for manufacturing. Maybe they made it a little bit cheaper, right? But they could just buy the products from me mm -hmm. and maybe they make $5 less if they bought them from me. So they make $5 more, but who cares? And, and here's the other thing, uh, you know, and there's this attitude also, this philosophy, like a lot of time, and this was the whole shareware thing with games, right? When uh, Doom came out, Wolfenstein and Cap Commander Keen, right? Those games, they kind of created the shareware model of video games. It's like, give it away for free. They're going to steal it anyway. So mm -hmm. let's just give it away. And then they'll be happy to pay for the, the final big version of it, right? But it got everybody playing those games. And so you basically, um, the people who are copying and pirating your games were helping you. They're marketing for you. They're putting your name everywhere. That's a good thing, right? And what does it cost? It costs just a little bit extra that you're not making on each one of those sales directly, but you're making it indirectly by product mind share and market share, right? And yeah. your brand. I agree. So you already started a, a topic about investors. So if you do you really think you need uh, some kind of, or you should take some kind of, for example, financial help from other people? If yes, is it worth it? And... Uh, that's it. This is the end of the part one. In the next part, we will be talking about money, investors, Kickstarter, manufacturing and much more. I would like to thank Andre for finding time to share these very useful tips with us and thank you for watching, liking, commenting and subscribing. If you want, you can check out our Fedevel online courses where we cover topics from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again and see you next time. Bye.